What if I told you that I could take this ball, cut it up into five pieces, and take those five pieces, rotate them, shift them around, and reassemble them into two balls of this exact same size? You'd tell me that's impossible, even if you know the theorem that I'm alluding to. But why is it impossible? What is being violated by this reassembly into two balls of the same size? I want you to think about it very carefully and come up with a detailed explanation of what it is that makes it impossible. I'll wait. Did you figure it out? I think any explanation that you're likely to have come up with will involve something to do with conservation of mass or conservation of volume. And those are physical principles, but they're based on something more fundamental from a mathematical perspective. Any explanation that you came up with is going to require some notion of measurement. You need to measure the mass or the volume of the ball in order to argue that what I just claimed you could do, breaking it up into five pieces and reassembling them into two balls of the same size, violates some principle. That's what I want to discuss right now, is this notion of measurement. That's going to be largely what we study during this next quarter, is the theory of measurement. We call it measure theory. But let's get started a little less formally, and let's reduce our example from three-dimensional balls to a one-dimensional example, a circle. And let's talk about sets in the circle. So keeping things simple, let's take the unit circle okay, that I've drawn right here, the set of points in the complex plane of unit length. Okay. I'd like to assign to sets in this circle a measurement. In this case, it's going to be something like length. I'm going to call it P. P in this case is going to stand for proportion. So if I take some set in the circle, like that segment right there, I want to assign to it a number which talks about the proportion of the whole circle that that set is made up of. Okay. So let's write that down. That's the proportion of the circle. So that's going to be a number between 0 and 1. The only thing that is proportion 1 is the whole circle. The empty set is proportion 0. And some things in between, like this collection of intervals around there, maybe a few dots down here, is going to be measured by some proportion in between 0 and 1. So this is a number between 0 and 1. Of course, every calculus student knows how to do this proportion measurement. You just calculate the lengths of the segments and add them up. Okay, the arc length. That's what we're measuring here. The arc length as a fraction of the total length, which in this case would be 2 pi. So we'll come back to that. But let's think a little more abstractly for a moment. What are the basic properties of this proportion measurement that we know must be true? Let's take a look. So the first property is that, as we said, the measurement of the entire circle, the proportion of the set that is the whole circle in itself, is 1. And for all subsets of the circle, the proportion measurement is a number between 0 and 1. Okay? Now, the next property, which is really the fundamental one that caused you to feel that breaking up this ball that way and reassembling it into two balls is impossible, is the next one. Property 2. If I take two subsets, 
of the circle, and they are disjoint from each other. Okay? In other words, if there are no points in common between the two subsets, then the proportion of their union together, the two pieces together, is just the proportion of the first plus the proportion of the second. Okay? That's the fundamental conservation law here. And let's make a natural generalization of this. From property two, right here, I can do mathematical induction. And I can say, well, if I have three disjoint subsets, then the proportion of the circle taken up by the union of those three is the sum of their three proportions. And if I take n for any finite n, I can argue by induction that this proportion measurement function is additive over finite sums. A finite union of disjoint subsets, the proportion is the sum of their proportions. It seems like a mild generalization, and one that ought to be true, that we should be allowed to take countably infinite unions as well. So I'm going to call that property 2 prime here. And that is, suppose I have an infinite sequence of subsets that are all disjoint from each other. Okay, if we want to be precise, that means that for any pair of them, their intersection is empty. Okay, then we should find that the proportion of that disjoint union is the sum of their proportions individually. Okay, so those are some fundamental properties of measurement, which I hope we all agree ought to be true. Now there's a third one relevant in this example and in the ball example, which has to do with the kinds of motions that I described that led to the impossibility result. After all, I could certainly take that ball, cut it into two pieces, and then mold the two pieces into two balls. And maybe if I heat them to cause them to expand, I could create two balls of the same size. Physically, they'd probably weigh less each, but let's not worry about that. But those aren't the kinds of motions that I was talking about. What we want is to do rigid motions in space. We want to take those five pieces that we cut the first ball into and do nothing other than rotate and translate them in order to move them into the positions to form the two new balls of the same original size. Now, what that means is that each of those five pieces is congruent to the new ones after the action. So this is the third property of the measure that we're talking about, which has the properties of measurements of balls in three-dimensional space, which is that if two subsets of the circle are congruent to each other, meaning precisely that you get one from the other by doing rotations in the circle, or maybe reflections as well, but we don't need to worry about that, then that should not change their proportion. Okay, so congruent sets have the same proportion in the circle, the same measurement. So there is a set of properties that are very natural. And here is the interesting theorem. There's no such thing. These properties, in particular, properties 1, 2 prime, and 3, are logically inconsistent. It is impossible to find a measurement function which satisfies those three properties. So here's the proof. We're going to use rotation. So if I take some subset of the unit circle, you might think of it as an arc, although it doesn't have to be an arc, as we'll see, it can be a much wilder set. And an operation I can do on it is I can fix some point in the unit circle. If here's the center of the circle, then you might think of that point there as the point U. And I can multiply everything in the set E by U. Okay? That is, the set U times E is the set of all points UZ 
where z is in E. Now, E is a point in the unit circle. If you like, you can think of U as E to the I theta. And what happens when you multiply a complex number by E to the I theta? You rotate its phase. So what this does is it rotates this whole set E around by angle U. That is an operation that preserves congruence. Okay, the set UE and the set E are congruent to each other. So that means that doing a rotation like that doesn't change this proportion measurement of the set E. The new rotated set E has the same measurement as the old one. Great. Now here's what we're going to do with those rotations. We're going to use them to partition the circle. Okay. We're going to partition the circle according to the equivalence relation, which says that two points in the circle are equivalent if you can get from one to the other by a rational angle rotation. Okay, that's what this says here. Let's consider the subset T of the circle, which consists of rational angles. Those are points of the form e to the 2 pi i t where t is a rational number. Okay? This is a countable subset, countably infinite subset, of the circle. And now what I want to do is take the quotient of the circle by this equivalence relation, which means that I'm considering the set of all equivalence classes of points in the circle according to that equivalence relation. Two points are in the same equivalence class if they are rational angle multiples of each other, and they're not if the angle between them is not a rational multiple of 2 pi. Okay. Great, so I have this set of equivalence classes. What we're going to do is from each one of those huge uncountable equivalence classes, select exactly one representative. So for example, from the equivalence class consisting of T itself, those points that are a rational angle rotation of, say, the point 1, I can choose one point, maybe I'll choose the point minus 1. That's a perfectly fine representative from that equivalence class. Then from another equivalence class, say the point e to the 2 pi i times root 2, which is not in the same equivalence class because it's not a rational multiple of that angle, I'll choose a representative from that one, probably the point e to the 2 pi i root 2 and so on. I can't, of course, actually make a list of them, but I can choose exactly one representative from each of those equivalence classes. And I'm going to let phi, capital phi, denote the set of all those representatives. So for each equivalence class, I choose a representative, little phi, and I'll let capital phi denote the set of all those representatives. Okay. What's special about that set phi? Here is what's special about that set phi. I can get every point in the circle by taking a rational angle multiple of one of those elements in phi. And if you think about it for a moment, that's more or less exactly the definition of the set phi. What is this saying? Well, let me pause for a moment and note some notation here. I'm using this square union notation to mean that this is a disjoint union, okay? So there's actually two statements here. One is that the circle is the union of those rotations. And the second statement is that if I have two distinct elements of T, U1 and U2, then rotating the set phi by those two angles gives me disjoint sets. Okay. So let's think about why each one of those is true. As I said a moment ago, property one is more or less the definition of what's going on here. Okay. What we've done is to choose a representative from every single equivalence class under rotation. And that means that for each 
point in the circle, it's in some equivalence class, and therefore there will be a representative in the set phi, which is a rational angle multiple away from it. Okay? Now as for point two, what if I take two distinct points in T, two distinct rational angles, and I take the set phi, and I rotate the set phi by those two, okay? Could it be that I get something in common between them? The answer is no, because phi is one representative from each equivalence class, and the equivalence classes are all disjoint from each other. Okay. So property two follows again from the definition of equivalence relations. Equivalence classes are distinct from each other. And that means that these two sets here consist of disjoint points from disjoint equivalence classes. Okay, so I've generated this set phi, a subset of the circle. And I now can reassemble the circle by taking this countably infinite disjoint union of rotations of that set phi and putting them together. Maybe that doesn't sound like a problem right now, but consider this. From property two, or property two prime, because that is a disjoint union, the proportion measure of the whole circle, which is the proportion measure of this disjoint union, is equal to the sum over all of those u's of the proportion measure of that u times phi. So that followed from property two prime of our desired properties of proportion measurements in the circle. But we also have property three, which is that congruent sets should have the same measurement. So the proportion of u times phi is the same thing as the proportion of just phi itself. Now what's the proportion of phi? What is the measurement of this crazy set phi? which consists of representative elements from each equivalence class. Well, I don't know, but I can tell you that it's a number between zero and one, right? And so we have really two cases to consider here. If phi has measurement zero, then this is just the sum of countably many zeros, and that would be zero. On the other hand, if phi has some measurement bigger than zero, maybe it's 0.5, maybe it's root two over two, maybe it's one, whatever it is, then adding up that number, that positive number, countably infinitely many times, would give us infinity. So those are the only two possibilities here. This sum equals either zero or infinity. But let's go back along this chain of equalities and note that that number there has to be equal to the proportion measure of the whole circle, which by property one is equal to one. And that is a contradiction. So that contradiction means that these three properties are mutually logically inconsistent. It is not possible for such a function for measuring to exist. So that's a little mind bending. What happened there? Okay. In particular, it seems to contradict calculus because that proportion measure is something that we work with with calculus students every day. You just integrate d theta over the set E, although you gotta be careful to normalize it, okay? There's our proportion measure. That will exactly compute the proportion of E, the arc length of the set E divided by two pi, the arc length of the unit circle. So since I can write down this formula for it, 
how can it fail to exist as we just proved? Well, the answer lies in an important subtlety in the definition of the Riemann integral, if you think back to a rigorous course in calculus that you took. This integral over a set here, you cannot plug in any old set. Okay. Riemann defined this over sets that were intervals or unions, perhaps countable collections of intervals, perhaps finite collections of intervals. Now, with a modern treatment, you can do better than that. The term that's often used is paveable sets. Okay. But one way or another, you cannot just put any old set there. And it turns out that that set phi that we created by taking a representative element from each equivalence class, when we take the quotient of the circle by rational angles, that set is not nice enough for the Riemann integral to make sense. It is not a paveable set. Okay. So that means that we cannot just take the measurement of every kind of set. There are only certain nice sets that can be measured. Not every set falls into that category. Now, to be clear, we are going to spend a lot of this quarter figuring out how to extend the Riemann integral beyond the very limited set of paveable sets where it's defined. And we will define a more general integral called the Lebesgue integral, which works over more and nastier sets. But the truth is, thanks to the no-go theorem we just proved, we cannot extend it everywhere. We cannot define such a measurement function on all sets. Okay, It's impossible to do that. So the moral of the story is that this thing here, the power set, the set of all subsets of the circle, which is what that notation stands for, it's just not possible to have that as the domain for our measurement function. Instead, we have to replace it with some proper subset of the power set. Okay. The measurement function in this setting and in many settings, as we'll see, cannot be defined on all possible subsets. It will only be definable on a certain smaller collection of nice subsets. In the context of probability theory, those nice subsets are what we will call events. Okay. Now that might seem like a bad sign, but it's actually a fundamental truth that is beneficial to our intuition in probability theory. We're about to embark on a journey together to develop Kolmogorov's theory of probability as developed a century ago and still developing today. A fundamental tenet of this information theoretic framework for probability is that we can measure probabilities of events, but only those events that we have current information about. We don't always have complete information. And so there will be some sets, some collections of outcomes that we just can't assign probabilities to. They're not in the domain of our knowledge. And so the probability measure cannot always be defined on all sets. It can only be defined on certain nice sets that we call events. And we're now going to develop a theory of measurement called measure theory for the fundamental principles that will allow us to consistently develop such measurement functions and avoid contradictions like we just saw. Now, what about the ball? Well, as to those unmeasurable sets, something had to give. And if we give up on allowing all subsets to be measurable, then some pretty strange but inescapable consequences come up. And that brings us to the Banach-Tarski paradox, proved in 1942. If you take any two subsets of R3, of three-dimensional space, or actually four or five-dimensional space, anything bigger than three-dimensional. If you take any two subsets that have non-empty interior, then you can take one of those subsets, cut it up into a finite number of pieces, 
and with only rigid motions in space, reassemble those pieces into the other set. So it doesn't need to be a ball converted into two balls of the same size. I could take this ball, I could cut it up into some finite number of pieces, rotate and translate them around, and reassemble them into the solar system. That's what the banach paradox says. Stated in terms of the ball, it's actually a more precise theorem proved five years later by Robinson that if the two sets are a solid ball and two solid balls of that radius disjoint from each other, then the banach paradox can be accomplished with n equal five. He exhibited an explicit decomposition of a ball into five pieces to be reassembled with rigid motions into two balls of that same radius. So that is the banach paradox, and it is inescapable in our mathematical universe. Of course, there's always subtleties. Those of you who are fans of mathematical logic will realize in the middle of the proof, right here, that I chose exactly one point from each equivalence class, which invoked something called the axiom of choice from set theory. And there are people, although fewer and fewer of them, I think, who think the axiom of choice must be wrong because of contradictions like this and try to develop mathematics without it. It turns out it is possible to construct a theory of the real numbers in which every subset is measurable if you don't have the axiom of choice. We're not going to do that here. The axiom of choice is true. Too much of mathematics doesn't work without it. And so we're just going to have to live with weird consequences like the banach tarski paradox. But there is a silver lining. It gives us the greatest mathematics joke in history, which is, what's an anagram for banach tarski <laughs>